Uh, great. Uh, so today, uh, I would like to uh, talk about uh, the Zwicky Transient Facility. Um, and I know that uh, the all of you have a big are committed to the CTA, which is an upcoming um, high energy astronomical facility. And uh, uh, you're very interested in, in transients. And you may want to regard ZTF, Zuki Transient Facility, as a, a precursor uh, to the next big survey that's happening, which is the uh, LSST undertaken by the Rubin Observatory. Um, and in fact, uh, in large part, the National Science Foundation funded uh, or co-funded ZTF uh, to, for us to precisely do that, which is to, uh, as a precursor, a facility precursor survey uh, and understand um, uh, and develop, help develop not just ourselves, but the community as you'll soon see, okay? Great. Um, so let's see, how did the, uh, the as you know, the universe uh, was actually very simple when it began. Uh, if you look at one part in the universe, so here's a red shift at the part atop. So it's a two dimensional representation. Here, there's one part of the universe to another part. In the beginning, the, um, the matter density and the uh, energy density was uh, the same to one part in 10 to the five. And it matters, it was one part in 10 to the five and not uh, zero because it is that small um, fluctuations which gave rise to, and uh, thanks to long range of gravity, gave rise to gradual condensation of the baryonic uh, and dark matter, which then led to stars, groups of stars to galaxies, ga clusters of galaxies, uh, groups of galaxies to clusters, and so on and so forth. But the universe was actually even simple in other ways. The universe is chemically simple. Um, in fact, the chemistry in the young universe is very simple. There's hydrogen and helium and almost nothing else. Uh, it turns out it can actually form a little molecule out of hydrogen and helium, which was only recently um, found, not in the universe, but in the lab. Uh, anyway, but the rest of the periodics uh, table uh, was empty. And so I would say uh, in the last century, uh, the great achievement of astronomers and physicists working together was to understand how did we go from a, such a simple universe, chemically speaking, hydrogen and helium, to filling up the periodic table. Or, and we understood it qualitatively. We understand you know, how this, but then in this century, we hope to finish this problem, which is not how do we get to some amount of chromium, but why do we have the amount of chromium we have, let's say, related to hydrogen? That is, our goal right now is to determine the filling uh, the, you know, the, the fact, the uh, numerically, the abundance of the periodic table, okay? And uh, for this, you need to understand three things. For the light elements here, you know, up to a CNO, you can get stars like the sun, then the, then the slightly more massive stars can proceed up to alpha elements here. But by the time you start reaching very high Z elements, in particular to reach the sun, it's uh, iron itself, uh, you need supernova, and to certainly go beyond super uh, iron, the peak, you need exotic supernovae. Okay, uh, so that's where the supernovae come in. And uh, um, the history of supernovae research, I would say, really begins with uh, Fritz Zwicky, uh, who was a uh, Swiss astronomer uh, or physicist hired by Caltech on the eve of Caltech getting money from the Rockefeller Foundation to build the 200 inch telescope. Okay, so he came to Caltech in the late twenties. Uh, he was the only astrophysicist we had because we didn't have an astronomy program then. And in fact, the astronomy program only got founded uh, after you know about 1950 or something uh, by Jesse Greenstein. Um, <clears throat> So uh, uh, here's Zwicky, oh, circa 1936 maybe. And uh, uh, working with Bade, uh, he um, uh, did pioneering research with, uh, in um, uh, Noviants uh, uh, in basically explosive transients. And uh, the two coined a new word at that point called super-nova, which are a group of objects 
that are brighter than uh, Nova. In fact, they're 10 to the four times brighter. And now, of course, we accept that word without a hyphen. Zwicky uh, appreciated that the newly invented Schmidt telescope, so this is the first, is the second Schmidt telescope in the world, maybe the first actually, uh, because the, the, the corrector lens was in fact run by Schmidt himself, who was a great optician. And uh, this is an 18 inch Schmidt that was put together and started operations at Paloma, uh, about 36, I think. And he began a pioneering study of doing systematic investigation of the sky for supernovae. And it's in his honor uh, when I had an opportunity to name a new facility, it, uh, I would name it as a Zwicky Transient Facility. Okay, well, supernovae are one part, but to go to very high Z elements, we know we need even more exotic uh, uh, explosions. Um, just a second. Uh, so uh, we need even more exotic explosions. Um, just a minute. Okay, uh, and that uh, we now know is in fact uh, uh, the uh, coalescence of neutron stars, which produces uh, uh, the very high Z elements, uh, so the so-called R process elements. Okay. Okay. So I thought I'll I'll lay down the intellectual foundation for uh, what is called uh, the what we now call a ZTF, but. This program began, you know, in in uh, uh, the uh, the first light was achieved for PTF, which I'd call it as phase one. So right now we're in phase four. So it was called a Paloma Transit Factory, ran for 2009 to 2012. Then Intermediate Paloma Factory Transit Factory for IPTF 2013 to 2016. Then we took a year off because we had constructed then 20 or more like two years. Then we started the uh, Zwicky Transient Facility, which is really phase three of this project. And that started in 2017, uh, finished in 2020. And starting last year, we are in phase four, which is ZTF phase two. Okay. Okay, let me. Uh, so one of the things uh, I sort of regard, you know, I have three or should I say uh, astronomers, I look up to uh, uh, in the sense I say, well, these are like amazing. I just don't know how these people even thought. Uh, what, uh, and from Pasadena, it's Fritz Zwicky, then I have uh, Jan Oort uh, and in, in uh, Western Europe and, uh, and uh, Zeldovich in Russia. Um, so uh, Zwicky was a pretty amazing guy. He was a really, um, I would say kind of a contrarian. I, I like that. Um, he said, I soon became convinced that all the theorizing would be empty brain exercise and therefore waste of time, unless one first ascertain what the population of the universe really consists of. Okay, so I know that many of you uh, have come to astronomy from physics background. So I have to give you my views <laughs> on, uh, now physics is a wonderful subject. In fact, it's sort of a, a key subject in science. And, uh, the point of physics is to is it's a it's an absolutely reductionist approach. So you look at diverse observations, see if there are patterns. Usually, it's discovered by astronomers and so on. And then you say, can I come up with a law that encapsulates these patterns? So you know that planets that go round, there's periods and so on. Then you come up and you have Kepler's laws. That's fine. That's the patterns. But then can I come up with a physical model which is some approximation to reality? And that's Newtonian mechanics. And presto, you get you immediately explain uh, very nicely. So with one equation, you can now simplify so many observations. In contrast, in contrast, astronomy is the opposite. The point of an astronomer is not to try to out-imagine the universe. Uh, it will be hopeless. The universe has 10 to the 11 galaxies. Each galaxy has 10 to the 11 stars. That means that 10 to the 22 systems. And the universe has 13 billion years to think and work and make changes. None, our imagination would simply not match that. And this is where I'm afraid that I sometimes tell my physicist friends that uh, they place too much emphasis on their ideas when in fact the real idea is out there and for us to go and discover. Um, to this, I had a small amount, I have a very strong thesis that discovery is really a function of technology and algorithms. Uh, in my opinion, um, 
if, uh, you know, you could be a great astronomer by simply being at the right time at the right place. Now, of course, it helps if you made the right time happen and the right place happen. So the, what you can discover is all the things you can do with your instrument. That's all there is to it. You can sit around and imagine as much as you want, speculate, but to make a discovery, you need gizmos. Okay, even if you build stuff, I would say, why waste your time? You, sh you should automate, okay? That, anyway, and that's been the principal driving goal for PTF through ZTF. And, and at the risk of annoying some of my colleagues uh, in a talk here at Princeton, I said the best way to do astronomy is to get the astronomers out of the dome because uh, humans tend to slow things down. They have too many ideas, usually not so great. Uh, let the machines do the work that they, they usually end up doing a better job. Okay, so um, the, the um, oops. Um, so the idea for uh, ZTF, uh, what became, uh, eventually became ZTF um, was uh, due to a course I was teaching, you know, and that's the one thing that's about nice thing about being a professor is you're forced to teach, which means you have to actually understand what you're doing. Uh, it's only when you teach, you know how much you know and what you don't know. So as a fun exercise for my high energy astrophysics class, I considered uh, a, a toy model where I said, okay, you have two neutron stars that collide. And we know, of course, it's a very complicated thing, but as the Fermi energy of the neutrons is lifted, maybe in the outer portion, some of the uh, neutrons can decay freely. So it's a nice and analytical because uh, the neutron decays simply with standard radioactivity. So I can write down a simple formula for the heat supplied by neutron decay. And it turned out, I was surprised, that even 10 to the minus four solar mass of neutron decay would in fact power a source that would be visible in the sky at about minus 13 to minus 14th magnitude and lasting maybe a few days, okay, which I, at that time I called it as a macronova. And then I said, well, astronomers are looking at supernovae, many of them, a few are studying novae, why not build a machine to go after this area? And that was the start of PTF, okay? So the idea of PTF was, it's a factory. It's very, I chose the name very deliberately. It's at Palomar, it studies transients, and it is designed to be a high target throughput machine, okay? So, and this is to systematically study explosion, not just supernovae like here, not just novae like here, but anything in this phase space, okay? Uh, now we all talk hardware, which is necessary, then we'll, astronomers learn the bad way, that software actually matters. And we all now know we pay more for software than hardware. But if you're doing a project like this, you also need, need what I, I, I'm adding this. I call it as grayware, which is gray matter, which is an English term for brain. So it's like brain power. You really need that. So PTF, we went from concept to first light in 26 months. Uh, I do tell you that I have this uh, uh, a very strong view that uh, anything worthwhile doing in life, in my opinion, at least for me, you have to do it in a, fine, in a very short time. Uh, it's almost impossible for me to imagine working for 20 years in my life to get a project. So this went from 26 months and we were on. And uh, so many young people, uh, Nick Law had just finished his PhD from Cambridge, UK. Uh, Quimby had finished his PhD from Texas, uh, Austin. Aranofek from Tel Aviv. And so all of these guys, basically they're made, he was a project scientist for this whole project. And this guy's software lead, which doesn't sound great job, but it's the worst job because you have to actually integrate everyone's software. And this was a ro robotic uh, aspects manager. Machine learning was introduced to us first time by Professor, who is now who has become Professor Bloom. Peter Nugent led the image differencing pipeline. Our engineer, Rick, Richard DeCaney, led the hardware and the photometric pipeline was led by Jason Sures. Okay, so let's see what are the, just a second. Okay, so um, let's, uh, I'm going to use a diagram here, uh, which I, I'm going to call it the Zwicky diagram. And that is the time scale of the event on one axis, one day, 10 days, one year, and luminosity, peak luminosity in the visual band. Um, absolute luminosity on the on the y-axis. Uh, I had to make my slight joke about our physics friends. You know, uh, astronomy is a very rich subject, which is why many um, physicists want to come and work in astronomy. Um, so 
and uh, you know physicists are pretty bright guys so we thought very hard and so the main thing is we use um, uh, first of all we use cgs and that makes physicists very confused at times but then when we use magnitudes which is log and then you multiply it by 2.5 and so on at this point the physicists just give up they say oh no we can't handle this it's just a joke okay so you have a phase space here the thermonuclear 1a supernovae here that uh, and then the core collapse, these things uh, produce uh, black holes or neutron stars, and sometimes uh, uh, they actually simply explode. And then, of course, the classical novae, which are explosions on the surfaces of white dwarfs or in the disks of accretion disks, okay, in general, uh, the whole novae phenomena. Okay, so once, uh, um, once you have a machine like this, as I told you, the job of the astronomer is not to sit around and actually say, uh, uh, you know, uh, speculate what they could be is to in fact go find what it, there is so nature rewards we build machines and this is not just to uh, i just don't want to say that the pop population populating this diagram is not just uh, uh, ptf but many surveys that come, came in at the same time plan stars one little later assassin and now of course we have uh, atlas uh, ctf and so on Okay, well, wow, look at this. So many new things are popping up. Luminous supernovae, super luminous supernovae. So these are 10 times brighter than supernovae. They live 10 times longer. So they have their total energy, volumetric energy releases 10 times more than thermonuclear supernovae. Then we have supernovae, which are so rich in calcium. Okay, don't understand why only so much calcium. Then we have a whole new category here, and which initially we called as luminous red novae. Yes, they're bright. They're red at peak and they're new, okay? But it turns out there's two groups. This group here that I'm circling is uh, so-called ILRT, intermediate luminosity red transients. And then this group is really now only reserved for luminous red novae. We believe that this is due to coalescence, not coalescence, merger of two stars. Uh, stellar merger happens quite frequently. It's once one every 10 years or so in the Milky Way, for instance. And this we, speculate is due to electron captured supernovae okay and there are some things we don't understand that we gave a name but I'm not very sure that's correct okay so uh i don't want to go into detail because you know ptf has been running 2009 to 20 now to 2021 and uh we have been averaging you know a paper every two weeks since we began maybe we're speeding up a bit now so there's a lot of papers have happened so i and I have to give you, so my summary is mainly by the way of methodology and that is the spirit that I told you. My view is build a machine, the astronomy is straightforward and writing the papers even may straightforward. In fact, if you have good data, uh, it writes the paper itself. Uh, there are times when in over two days I finished a paper. And so as some of you know, I, have a, um, I do like to send papers to nature, it's short, sweet, and then you're out with it. And in just two days, uh, if you have good data, you can just bash through the thing. But building the machine, no, that's not two days. That it can take many years. So let me focus only on the technology. Um, so in phase one of, of, uh, of uh, uh, which we call Palomar Transit Factory, we, um, at that time it was novel. And thanks to Josh Bloom, uh, he convinced me we should really uh, introduce machine learning and really, really work. It really got rid of a lot of manual labor from the particularly to distinguish genuine transients from bad subtractions. Um, a lot of the science in those days was you find a supernova, you or candidate, you report, a couple of days later, someone is in a telescope, they get a spectrum, all this sort of stuff. Okay, but we went into same night classification. You know, uh, it's easy now, but those days are a little harder as usual. Things get better with time usually. In phase two, we introduced mixed cadence observing because for phase one, I said, let's stick to one color. We'll do one kind of survey and that's it, like a five night survey. So we could harvest a lot of supernovae. Uh, we introduced multiband. Uh, of course, if you know more bands, it's, um, there's more information, but there's more complexity and not all the time complexity gives you the information. But the most important thing we did in phase two was a robotic in integral field unit spectrograph. Uh, and demonstrated it. So let me explain this. Um, when, um, uh, for, so for those of you who are um, uh, not optical astronomers, uh, uh, let the part you have to understand is um, um, the, uh, in, in, um, 
um, when you have to get a spectrum, you really need uh, the traditional approach. You have a slit, and it's very fine. It's usually an arc second or so. Um, and so you acquire this field. Uh, then you say that's a star, and usually you argue with the colleague whether it's really the star, whether the north is up, and so on. Then you use a joystick, put the star in the slit, then you expose. So that takes time and also takes a person. Okay. So um, uh, <clears throat> the um, so in in, uh, in in robotic spectroscopy, what we do is uh, um, uh, basically uh, it's a it's a it's a system where you can. Um, about 30 by 30 arc seconds, you slew the telescope and every pixel in that 30 by 30 arc second, we get a spectrum. Two things, one is there's no arguing with your friend whether north is up and it's a star because it's all in. And then you don't have to be there. You don't have to be awake at all. Any telescope points pretty well, so to 30 by 30 arc seconds. So, it, so that's, a part, that's, I would say, great innovation that we did. Uh, <clears throat> okay, um, so, um, then in preparation for LIGO, we did an, what I call the needle in haystack search, which is, can we really look at, at that time, 100 square degrees and demonstrate that we can actually find a fading transient? It's not so easy because many, uh, this is a mistake many people not uh, new to, or who are new to time domain don't get it. Uh, let's say in your own uh, program, CTA, you're looking for some object, uh, you have found an object and you want to find the optical counterpart. Naturally, as an experiment uh, in, in, in with CTA, you'll be, you'll be thinking what that counterpart looks like. You'll have some ideas. Maybe they're right or wrong, doesn't matter. You have some ideas. The point is that you know what you're looking for approximately. However, the sky doesn't care. The sky is going to supply a very large number of false positives. And the trick in this business is not to set up a filter to find what you want, is to set up a filter to reject what you don't want because that is much larger than what you want. Anyway, and that's the part we did. And we, are not, we, we can now do routinely a search of a thousand square degrees. And given the certain features, you say, this is the kind of transient I'm looking for. We can isolate that and reject all the others at a very high level of confidence. Okay, phase three is a ZTF uh, and we finished. It was so successful that NSF funded us for an extended op operation. And here we introduced uh, alert distribution. Okay. So here's an example of why it's not so easy to find what you want, but we, we did that in, in IPTF era. Okay, so what we were able to demonstrate, which was a novelty then is, as you know, gamma ray burst, they produce, um, uh, many of them produce uh, uh, afterglow. The burst itself may be a few seconds, but the afterglow can last uh, um, uh, maybe uh, hours or days, okay? But mostly you use the gamma ray trigger and then you go and look for where the gamma ray burst is strong as they pointed out. Well, we are now in a position we actually can find GRB afterglows without even a trigger. So here it is. There's a reference image, which is a standard reference image. And then we have, we have taken consecutive pictures, nothing here. Okay, February 26.38, something is coming up, 26.43, this is in hours. Okay, it's uh, slowly fading away, 26.50. And then we can do so many things here. Okay, see what's happening here, you know, this flag by software, spectrum from Keck, Swift slews. And then it turned out, and we, we knew this is an afterglow because it smells like an afterglow. And then a couple of days later, when the data from the Mars mission came in, the actually parent GRB was found, okay? But now we find this routinely. We can actually now find GRBs without GRB triggers. Okay, so as I told you, I have a somewhat of a gizmo approach. I said, why don't we automate the discovery of the universe? So here's my vision for that, which is, um, can, we, um, can we find um, something which is, um, you know, uh, a, a machine um, that I'll come in in the morning and I'll say, machine, um, tell me all the interesting things you've done uh, because it is observed. Then I look at the thing, then I sit down, work hard through the paper, I write a paper, 
then go in the evening, play a game, have a nice wine, come back the next day and keep doing this. That sounds like a glorious view for me. Of course, the next phase is I come in and the paper is written. Okay, so this is the goal of ZTF, which is how much more automation can we introduce? Okay, and now it's become a very large project. It's got big support from NSF and worldwide partnership. We have a large number of partners. Last I counted, we have 14 partners around the world. It starts from Taiwan and ends in California. Okay. Um, okay, so we built, uh, so our approach was to build a super large telescope. It's got 47 square degrees. Um, and uh, this, I don't think it's really to scale. This is, this is 47 square degrees. This little bit looks a bit too large to, uh, to be four times that. But anyway, uh, on, this is the largest field of view on the, on the smallest telescope here, because this is a 1.2 meter Schmidt telescope. LSST is 10 square degrees behind a six meter equivalent telescope. Panstars is behind a 1.8 meter. Subaru is uh, behind an eight meter and so on. So we went deliberately what I call as shallow. It's in fact, we even do not expose for a long time. It's only 30 seconds. Because when you want to make a discovery, in my experience, you really want to find the brightest. You want to go faint enough to make a discovery that there's volume and bright, as bright as possible so that you can do follow. Going faint is not necessarily helpful. A lot of people, you know, and I have to give you my, uh, not so much complaints and observation. Uh, many people who pro are involved in LSST will say, LSST will discover Gadzillian supernovae. Well, that's not true. In order to actually discover something, you have to know a bit more than just finding it, okay? Uh, it's a very, con it's very uh, time dependent statement. Uh, you can, if you take two images, you can say something new has popped up. That's a candidate. It could be anything, okay? And then you can even give a probabilistic statement if that new thing is next to a fuzzy thing, i.e. a galaxy, but it's not discovery, okay? So yes, you can find many transients. So what? It doesn't mean much because there's a supernova every second in the universe and you can find many of them. And a hundred years ago, the first supernova would have been valuable. But today, you know, ZTF, not only we, we are total capacity for discovery or finding candidate is maybe 10, 12,000 a year. And of which we only pursue about 2000 because we can't pursue all of them. So I hope um, you, that you uh, appreciate that um, just because you can find lots of faint things, it doesn't mean you're finding your advancing knowledge at the same rate. There has to be a plan to pursue those faint things in a systematic fashion. Okay, what are the achievements of ZTF phase one? Uh, we went beyond machine learning, went to deep learning or fancifully called AI. And now we have an AI says discovery algorithm for comets. Uh, we can routinely find them and we are finding them. Uh, we have made discovery of asteroids within Earth's orbit, and we had the discovery of the, uh, an asteroid within the orbit of Venus, the first one, actually. We found uh, massive, the most massive white dwarf known to date. Uh, some speculation that if we wait long enough, it'll actually implode. It'll collapse and uh, explode. We have doubled the population of these peculiar calcium-rich supernovae. Um, in fact, we find low redshift supernovae so routinely, it's sort of become a nuisance now. Uh, we can find supernovae within hours of shock breakout. Uh, in the past, it would be that if you wanted to do young supernova research, you would, um, you know, it, you find something, then you call friends, there'll be a frantic activity. But now we'll say, yeah, you know, I got this party coming along. Why don't we just do this, you know, next Thursday? You know, the machine is there. We'll, we are assured of finding something. Then you, so now this is, instead of being drama, drama it is now routine. I have already spoke a bit about GRBs without GRB trigger. Maybe we found a class of cosmological relativistic explosions that in fact do not produce GRBs, but otherwise relativistic. This is yet to be proven, but it looks interesting. One of the things with ZTF that is new, and in fact, we're the only uh, facility, um, uh, we actually uh, supply transients in real time. So let me explain that. We supply transients, and these are called brokers. There's a this group in Berlin, Edinburgh, uh, in Santa Barbara, and then of course, um, uh, and in Tucson, uh, Santiago, and uh, also to these days, I think to Seattle. Uh, you know. So when we take two images, uh, take a reference image, a new image comes in, let's say right now, 
we do a sophisticated image subtraction, machine learning to take all the glitches out, and then we get uh, genuine candidates. Now, man, many of them are things that most of you are not interested. M dwarf flares, I think very few people are interested in that. They're interesting in their own right. Uh, dwarf novi, okay. Uh, eclipsing binaries. Uh, then finally, you, you know, um, uh, uh, moving things because when you move, you, you think it's a transit. So following LSST, we define an event as something which is a phi sigma change in right ascension, declination, or the flux in that band. If it is there, we call it an event. And we put out a very information rich packet to the people who are receiving this, okay? And uh, these brokers then uh, serve other communities. So, so for example, you could be talking with your colleagues in Germany if you want to receive these alerts or for the Southern Hemisphere, you could be talking to your colleagues in Santa Cruz. It's not necessary to talk to North or South. I'm just saying that, that each broker is not specializing in things. Okay, so that's what we do. And LSST will, of course, uh, uh, will have a rate which is maybe 30 times more than our rate. Uh, but it's the same, the, the industrializations happen. So let me explain, um, uh, and one example, I, you know, there's no way, just, way I can do justice to explain all the achievements of PTF through ZTF in, in, in a talk like this. So double degenerates. <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, the double degenerates are systems are of great value to astronomy. Of course, many of you are famous with the most, the most famous ones are double neutron stars. Both are degenerate, they coalesce, amazing things happen, okay? And, um, uh, but let me talk of double white dwarfs, okay? So let, here's a picture uh, taken at high speed, not with ZTF, with another, another camera. And what you see here is, you know, there's a star, but a very short amount, it flickers and goes away for briefly. Now it turns out this system is, in fact, a seven minute binary, 6.9, and that's a deep eclipse that you're seeing. It actually has even secondary eclipses. And this is a beautiful hypercam um, uh, light curves uh, um, obtained, uh, um, uh, I think from GTC. Um, so, uh, we, the, so these are two white dwarfs. One is uh, uh, hotter than the other which is why you see um, uh, the, and the, when the hot one is eclipsed uh, by the cool one, it's almost complete. The cool one is bigger. Um, and then the cool one itself is irradiated uh, by the hot one. And that's why you get the secondary eclipse. Okay, these systems are so uh, relativistic that even in, in our own data set, okay, that is from PTF to ZTF, we can actually see the orbital decay so this is the, you know, assuming if there's no decay, just like the Hulstailer system, the famous diagram, we see the orbit decay. You know, the, 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 because of the orbital decay, the eclipse doesn't happen at exactly the period, it's slowly drifting. And over this time, in, um, we can actually see the drift is 2,500 seconds. You can do general relativity with your wristwatch because most wristwatches keep time to better than a second, even over 10 years, okay? <laughs> so you don't need to do anything fancy at all to see a GR at, at work with these eclipsing systems. And um, what's shown here, uh, sorry, uh, why these systems are, so we, anyway, this is Kevin Burge, he's a, a thesis and he's now finished his PhD and gone off to MIT as a Papalado fellow. He's found so many of them, he's uh, practically doubled or tripled the population of eclipsing um, short pair systems, which are all radiating gravitational waves. Where will these be? These, these systems are the prime, the first thing when LISA goes up, they will see these systems. In fact, this particular source will be the brightest source for LISA. So while LIGO explores the band, you know, centered around, let's say, between 10 Hertz and maybe a kilohertz, LISA ex explores the band uh, centered around, you know, something like a millihertz to about uh, 100 millihertz. And this is where the uh, double degenerates come in. Okay, so what's shown here is that uh, get on the y-axis is the gravitational strain, and on the x-axis is the gravitational wave frequency, and millihertz is here, 10 millihertz is over here. And these are the systems which are eclipsing, which means you know the geometry very well. 
to within a degree. So we can actually predict, predict model because we know M1, M2, we can in fact predict the gravitational strain in both senses of polarization. And this would be really amazing for Lisa in by the way of calibration. Okay, so um, the last bit of my talk is on Zika phase two, which started just last September. We are almost, we've done now a year. And now there's a new partnership here. <clears throat> uh, some of the old ones came in, but the new ones, so just out of interest to you, um, and uh, so let me tell you the partners. We have the uh, uh, National Central University in Taiwan, Weizmann Institute in Israel. Then we have Oslo Klein Center in Sweden, uh, IN2P3 in France, uh, DESI and Humboldt University in Germany, uh, Warwick University in UK, uh, Trinity College Dublin uh, in Ireland, so you can see we have a huge European component then to University of Maryland, the College Park, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Northwestern University, and uh, uh, then Lawrence Livermore uh, National Lab, IPAC, and uh, first in Caltech. So it's a pretty large operation here. Okay, so the goals of ZK phase two is, um, you know, we want to, I really want to like to focus on cosmological relative transients especially without gamma ray emission, the so-called dirty fireballs. I, if they exist, they'll be really fun to find. And of course, by constructions, they won't produce gamma rays. Um, and the uh, investigation of double degenerates has been spectacularly successful. You know, Kevin Burgess' thesis has been revolutionary. So we want to go there. And of course, there's the usual stuff, you know, of improving our uh, computations. One of the new projects we have begun is uh, TDEs, uh, nuclear black holes, and this is in partnership with the Russian-German X-ray mission SRG. And we are now conducting the largest systematic supernova program, I would say in history. Um, and that is something like, not as I said, we can quote uncovered, discover supernova candidates, maybe a thousand a, a month, but we only look at the brightest, hundred or so per month and classify them. That means to tell you it is a supernova and what kind it is. Okay, and this is led by two young people, Daniel Purley, who is in uh, Liverpool in the UK, Christopher Fremling, who's a postdoc at Caltech. And so we classify objects which are, our, our goal is to be complete at 18.5 mag peak. And so we, we sort of go a bit below 19, just to be on the safe side. So this has been a fairly large substantial program and um, this is what happens. Um, we can now find supernovae. Some, our peak maybe is six or seven classifications a night. So we are now reached, uh, so here are, let's see, uh, blue is core collapse, red is 1A, uh, thermonuclear and black means uh, galactic uh, interloper, usually a dwarf nova, okay. So here's what's happening. You know, the first supernova that astronomers understood is, is something unusual. It was S Andromeda, 1860. Then, you know, Zwicky, um, the things, uh, uh, they finally gave it a name. Zwicky began its program, which it continued till about 50 years old. And then it's been steady for a long, was then when the electronic, the big service came in, exponentially rising, okay? But the number of follow-up telescopes is not. So the deficit between what you can discover and what you can understand is growing dramatically. Okay, so our goal has been to classify anything brighter than 18.5. So we're trying to hit to something like 1200 supernovae a year. So we actually do a bit better. And for that, we use this robotic spectrograph that I mentioned um, <clears throat> uh, with the IFU spectrograph. It's, by the way, this whole system is, is not just robotic, meaning, you know, we don't go there and all that. It's also self-sequenced for the whole month. We don't sit around and program every day. The, the dome opens up, pipelines are run, candidates are found, um, and there's no one actually operating this whole system at all. And high value candidates are chosen by an algorithm and sent to this, which then does the observations. Pipelines run, the spectra extracted, the spectra then fitted, again, no humans, to, to a library of supernovae and classification is done and an ATL is sent or a saying, yeah, it's a one end, here's the thing. Okay, so we are getting close to my vision of automated discovery. 
Okay, so here it is. We get 10 to the five alerts. That's typical. Sometimes we can reach about 500,000, but a few hundred thousand per night is, the, is a real, these are real. They're, they're, and they're, we already thrown out the moving objects from this, okay? And then we use a whole bunch of this surface classification to actually get to the ones we think are likely supernova. That's a lot of reduction, 10 to the five to 10. Well, it's easy to reduce. And what you don't want to do is throw the baby out of the bathwater. That is, if you also get rid of the real stuff, that's no good. So we actually have a false positive and false negative rate uh, um, metric, and it's called the ROC. And we have our ROC is excellent, actually. That is, our rejection of true events is extremely small. Okay. Um, and our acceptance of false events is, is very small, uh, maybe less than one in a hundred. Okay, so some of this is now getting automatically uh, classified through after the spectra are done, decision is taken and sent to the transient main web server. Okay, well, these are statistics. I'll, I don't want to dwell too much, but it, I hope you're just impressed with the large number you're seeing. We are not looking at 10 or 20. We're looking at thousands and thousands of supernovae, okay? And look at this collage. I just want the point here to impress you. It's like, it's like a machine, each of these supernova. Look at that, this. Then we can put it back in the Zwicky, Zwicky diagram. And this is done in real time. So if any, if you want to look at these things, next day you get up, there'll be a few more points, okay? Uh, just uh, just uh, Google for bright transient survey ZTF. Okay, so just from the space space, you know, things are interesting. So here it is. Look at how rich the sky is. And if we just take this data we have, okay, and we plot the magnitude versus duration, and this is called the Phillips relation. This is the one which, this is the key to the discovery of, uh, of uh, dark, uh, dark energy through supernovae. Uh, and uh, Mark Phillips, you know, is the real hero of this story. This is what allows one a supernova to be standardized. Apparently, there's an equivalent Phillips relation, but with a different tilt for, for the core collapse supernovae. And then you find all these outliers, 18 cow, many of you have heard of that. And now 20, uh, uh, so there's another 18 cow like object, 20 CXT. Uh, sorry, no, no, there's another uh, 20 CND. It's, uh, it's, it's even better than a cow. The paper is soon coming up. Um, so uh, the NSF very kindly uh, gave us um, a, a, um, uh, an older telescope, which we refurbished, roboticized, and now we, all, uh, we basically have the lease on that at no cost. And uh, grad student Yashvi Sharma, she's building a, um, spec, the, one of these ro robotic IFUs for this. So we should be able to uh, double the supernova classification and do, the, um, and do very fast photometry the sort I described starting uh, coming January. So let me end on a couple of things that might interest you. Um, many of you know IceCube is now producing routinely very high energy neutrinos and it's very intriguing. And of course, you know, as usual, people have ideas, uh, but ideas are, in my opinion, cheap. Uh, um, uh, but only when these ideas are, are actually real, then it becomes valuable. So uh, we have, uh, in this case, uh, maybe, you know, as I said, between 100 to 500,000 objects per night. Meanwhile, ISQ is not producing that vociferously, yeah, so that heavily, but it's producing now and then. And the question is, uh, we, 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 here we know many things, and here it's really new territory. Can we, you, how do we go from this one or two rare events from ISQ to all this stuff that's happening in the sky? Okay, it's the usual stuff. We are pretty good. We reject asteroids, stars, planets, correlate, we classify, and then it's hard work. You know, it's very, um, it's not definite until you start seeing pattern again and again. There are many possibilities, okay, of how you very get these high energy neutrinos, gamma rays, gamma ray bursts, so called failed gamma ray bursts, uh, uh, type two supernovae, which have very, um, uh, the, 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 the densities are very high. It's uh, uh, natural to produce a lot of um, uh, very strong collisions here. AGN maybe, tidal disruption events, oh, there are many possibilities. So, you know, you shouldn't take, it's a thing where you simply correlate. I mean, that's the best you can do. And if it keeps repeating, every time it repeats, then slowly your confidence grows. So with each ice cube event, you know, there's a whole group here in ZTF. 
they follow up and uh, frankly this is a bit of a crap shoot right because you don't know just because after an ice cube event you found something okay the sky is so rich many things are happening so you shouldn't you know you should do this as a fun activity but never take it seriously until 100 times over it's done the same thing happens okay so you know it turns out we believe that maybe you know there's some hints that some of these ice cube events may be correlated with uh, td but these sorts of probability calculations are, as you know, historically very tough. There's the whole, do you understand the uh, look elsewhere effect correctly? Do you understand the sky itself correctly? And you have freedom, you know, here's um, the ice cube event happened here. Why didn't we, we can say, hmm, that's, uh, why didn't it make it here? Why didn't it make it there? Well, we don't know, but we, um, we have enough of a machine that over time we hope this will, uh, this will, um, uh, uh show okay so there's some hints of uh, neutrinos from tdes uh, or ice cube when uh, colleagues are excited they're also excited about uh, uh looking at uh, dust echoes um or uh, as an indicator of tdes and then uh, which in which if in this hypothesis are related to high energy neutrinos okay it's early days so the next one is uh, stellar black holes so as you know um, that uh, 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 LIGO has been finding uh, co uh, coalescence of black holes. And the peculiar thing here is that the black holes that are being inferred, the masses, they're really massive. You know, there's like one which is, I think, 70, 80 solar masses or something. 50, 50 solar masses are like routine now. Well, that's not obvious at all because in our galaxy, no stellar black hole is 80, 50. Maybe highest is 30. Okay, we don't seem to know how to make that. So one idea is in fact that these are not stellar black holes made in one shot, but they're made in two shots. Okay, so let's go into the central regions of galaxies. You have a stellar massive supernova, massive, supermassive black hole in the center. There's an accretion disk. And then just because of a mass segregation, there are a lot of stellar black holes hanging around. Then they go hierarchical merging and produce these very massive black holes. And then when, when the, so that's fine. That, that seems like a good, um, you know, it seems like a reasonable picture, okay, without invoking very exotic ways to make very massive stellar black holes. But now let's say that not all supermassive black holes have an accretion disk on them, but one in 10 do, and let's say there's a, there's a binary system here and in the disk, because that's where they'll be hanging around here, yeah, not necessarily in the disk, but in the inner regions. It, it coalesces, which means the mass is reduced. So now it sets off a, a disturbance in the accretion disk, okay? So this accretion, uh, <clears throat> so the, due to this disturbance, okay, uh, you could then get an event, okay? As, as uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, and uh, you could then get uh, further uh, bond dihyl accretion and therefore, maybe there's an electromagnetic signal following coalescence if it happens in the accretion disk of a galaxy. Now you say, well, there's so many ifs and maybes. Yeah, what else do you do? This is frontier territory and we have to, you know, uh, be a little imaginative and keep our eyes open. That's, that's what's happening here. So, um, uh, led by Matthew Graham, our project scientist, uh, uh, the group looked at 21 BBH triggers in O3, and then we just went through ZTF database uh, in that approximate region of the sky because the localization for the black holes is not so bad. The signals are very strong, and okay, here's here's sort of where you know the the signature is. Uh, this is where the black hole merger happens, and then apparently we're getting a pulse of extra emission. Okay. So yeah, it seems plausible. And this is a particularly fantastic one. It's 85 and 66 producing 142. That's this event, okay? These are ZTF light codes in three colors, G band, R band, and I band. Okay, uh, then you'll say, oh, of course, but there are so many false positives, right? So of course there are false positives. There are lots of agent in the sky, okay? And um, if you're finding these blips and claiming uh, evidence, we should also make sure that when we find a blip and if, um, uh, you know, uh, and LIGO is not looking, how do we know this is all true? So, you know, so we, they did a pro as best as they could, I suppose, look elsewhere effect. And 
the idea is it looks reasonable that there's something happening here, but um, I think what is the final thing? So let's see, I think they're 0.5% uh, right now, okay, of a chance, chance coincidence for this particular event. Okay, so there's some predictions, you know, if, if, uh, if this eventually, if this newly formed black hole um, eventually is supposed to, as the black, uh, black hole returns to the disk, assuming a typical kick, it will, uh, there'll be a flare one and a half years later. Um, so um, I wouldn't want to convince you that we have this, uh, it's interesting, that's what it can do if you have a large machine and the proof is very simple. I mean, this has to happen many, many, many times. Science is all about repeatability and if it repeats and repeats and repeats, then we have um, our confidence increases appropriately. Okay, let me wrap up. Uh, we're coming on the hour. Um, so um, uh, you have a very large project, uh, um, perhaps more organized as a high energy physics project. This is more as an astronomy project. It's really basically a lot of young people who come and go, graduate students and postdocs, undergrads, and, a, and some collaborators. So here's a group at Caltech. Um, all the young people are, uh, the very young people are grad students, slightly youngish people are postdocs, and the old ones are the uh, management, which is on the top. Um, and uh, I just want to say that uh, um, ZTF has been fun. It's been producing a lot of science results, but it's also, I, as I use that as a recruiting tool, for my students, uh, it, it allows you, it could uh, make you rich. Uh, it's making, it's going to make you famous likely, but can also make you rich. So there's some young people like Niharika, she's a data scientist who's joined. Many of our young people are doing a lot of data science because that's a natural um, counterpart to ZTF with all the data we're getting. And uh, so here's an example. Uh, so I recall that I mentioned that Josh Bloom who put in machine learning in 2009 uh, for our candidate identification uh, after image subtraction. Well, uh, after PTF finished, he took leave from Berkeley and founded a company called wise.io, which then a few years later, uh, it was, it, and he had a prospect, he said, said that we use a machine, he, that he has experience using machine learning to solve astronomical problems every night. And so that, that means they could solve earthly problems every day. Anyway, the company, then they sold it to GE and Josh is doing very well. It's a very nice house in the hills of Berkeley. Uh, I gave a talk at MIT um, in 2016, just before ZTF was going to start. And there was a young man in the audience. He came and told me that, I, and the stock was on the automated discovery of the universe. And that led him to set up a company in Boston and Bangalore called Sirocco. And this is about automation and software. And I told him, yeah, great. But when you go public, uh, you know, maybe send a few percent of those stocks and fund the ZTF. Okay, so let me stop here and take questions.